So today I'm going to explore the even darker side of narcissism. Like narcissism isn't dark enough already, but the darker underbelly, those really seriously ugly side of narcissism, the malignant narcissist. That's the scariest form of narcissist. And we're gonna dive in today in finding out what a malignant narcissist looks like and how to protect yourself. A malignant narcissist isn't just a narcissist. A regular narcissist has a very fragile sense of self. They have no sense of internal value. They try to grab all of their feeling of value from the external. They might devalue, debase others. They might beef up their own um, accomplishments. A malignant narcissist isn't just like your regular narcissist. A regular narcissist has no inner sense of value. They have no inner, inner sense of self. They're very fragile. They have very fragile egos, and they're entirely driven by everything external. So they need an endless amount of supply. And supply can be anything in the form of compliments, money, tangibles, um, a big job, big car, the right friends, living in the right neighborhood, anything that makes them look good on the outside. But um, it, supply can also be in the form of the, you know, abusive behavior, which is devaluing people, debasing people, judging people, putting people down, um, you know, all, all that sort of thing. And, and all narcissists have very little sense of inner self or none, and I've often said in my other videos that they're like the chocolate hollow Easter bunny. They might kind of look good on the outside, but there's absolutely nothing inside, and that's what's going on with a narcissist. So all narcissists have that. So, you know, whether you're a, a, a grandiose narcissist or a covert narcissist, you know, you're going to have these um, traits. And if you want to know more about covert narcissists, then you're going to want to check out my video on the covert passive aggressive narcissist. How a malignant narcissist differs, how it, however, is that this is where antisocial, dangerous behavior mixes with your regular garden variety narcissist. So you've got your fragile ego and you've got your little, you know, sense of uh, no sense of internal value. And you've got this person who's, you know, very much trying to make themselves look as good as possible, but it's also overlaid with an antisocial personality, a person who is extremely suspicious, who is potentially aggressive and potentially dangerous. This is the person that will stop at nothing to destroy like seriously destroy families, destroy careers, destroy homes, destroy, you know, work environments and potentially even countries or nations, depending on, you know, what kind of uh, position of power they're in. But they, they literally have that need for, it's such a need for control and, and such a deep-seated rage and hatred inside of themselves that they're not just trying to fill themselves with endless amounts of narcissistic supply, which is what most narcissists do. They're also, they have this antisocial personality disorder overlay. And so they, they literally have the power to destroy people. So what you'll see with a malignant narcissist is they get themselves into a position of power whether it's within the family dynamic or within a work environment or a, a company environment or anything like that. And then um, everybody around them is constantly walking on eggshells to not um, upset this person. And so, you know, they have the ability to be triggered so easily. You've heard the term hair trigger. These people have a very, very, very sensitive hair trigger and any little thing can trigger them to blow up go crazy and and completely try to obliterate somebody for a, the smallest little infraction they can just go nuts on someone because you know they didn't staple something the right way or they didn't you know hang the towel the way they were supposed to they'll absolutely lose it 
these people can come across as impulsive, um, destructive, um, aggressive, unstable, um, you know, and, and what really sets them off more than anything is any slightest little thing that looks to them to be, um, you know, a besmirch to them in any way. So for example, if you gave an opinion that differed from theirs, then, um, you know, you, are going to pay the price for that. You're going to have to look bad. Um, and, and, and they think that they are like demonstrating confidence and, and making them, making sure that everybody knows who's the powerful one by basically obliterating somebody for like the smallest little infraction. So this is a person that when other people are around them, people feel anxious. Uh, they feel intimidated by this person. They feel they, they're extremely fearful of this person, extremely fearful of what they're going to do. And so when you combine this, this, this feeling of fear and intimidation, um, and then they have absolutely no empathy because no narcissists have empathy for others. That's what makes them narcissists. Um, and their suspiciousness and their aggression uh, will cause a, a, a lot of destruction to people and can cause a, a lot of pain to people. If you think that you might be dealing with a malignant narcissist, give me a yes in the comments. So how a person might describe a malignant narcissist without, if they don't know that they're a malignant narcissist, they might say that they're jealous. They might say that they're petty. They might say that they're thin-skinned. They might say that they're punitive. They might say that they're angry or that they're shallow or that they have, um, you know, a, a, they can be impulsive, um, that they, they have a tendency to lash out very quickly over very small things. They also can tend to be very cunning, very sly, uh, very good at coming up with ways to hurt people in, in very sneaky ways. A malignant narcissist also tends to see the world in a very black and white way. So they're either smart or they're dumb. They're either rich or they're poor. They're either in or they're out. They're a loser or they're a winner. Um, they just see things in very, very black and white ways. They also hold feelings of grandiose superiority. So they think that they can say things that completely aren't true at all, have no basis in fact whatsoever, and believe that the, the world around them will believe everything that they have to say, and well, nobody will question it, that it's true because they said that it's true. According to Campbell's Psychiatric Dictionary, malignant narcissism combines the characteristics of narcissistic personality disorder, or NPD, antisocial personality disorder, or APD, aggression and sadism, either toward other self or both, and paranoia. So if you think that you are dealing with a malignant narcissist, then I highly suggest that you figure out a way to get out of this relationship. This is the person who might have a tendency to engage in things like violence, stalking, threats of violence, um, you know, they really will stop at nothing to destroy you. You know, there's certain types of narcissists that are pretty heinous as well, but they're not going to go after you to the point of destroying you because they don't want themselves to also look bad. This is the type of narcissist that they'll just stop at nothing because they think that they'll be able to get away with it. They live in such a distorted world that they Think that they'll be able to get away with it. So you really need to figure out a plan to get away from this person. Um, you know, if you're in a, in a marriage with this person, start figuring out what you need to do to get out of the relationship with this person. And if you're not thinking of divorcing the narcissist, then you need to figure out a way that you can create some serious boundaries so that this person cannot continue to hurt you. And part of creating boundaries is going to be having ways that they can only communicate with you, you know, in one way, one way in, one way out, something like that, um, or, or shutting off communication with them altogether would be the ideal way to go. But, you know, you definitely need to start creating a plan 
for how you're going to get out of this relationship with this person because th these people cannot be rehabilitated. They will not get better. Don't make excuses for them. That's another way that you can start protecting yourself is stop making excuses for them. Just understand that they're very sick individuals. They're mentally ill and you can't help them. You can't help them. So you need to figure out a plan to get out of this relationship with this person. So let's just take a little walk through memory lane here, shall we? I met you in November of 2015. So I can't believe it's been five years ago already. That's just crazy. Amazing. But um, you had come into my office because your wife had filed a domestic violence action against you, but you weren't uh, served with it. You just got served with a hearing. That's Correct. what it was. Yeah. So we knew that there was a hearing coming up like in a couple of weeks. And so you really just wanted representation at the hearing at that point. Right? Correct. Yeah. You, you did not want a divorce at that point. No. So you come in with your cousin and um, you said that there had been an incident. You had... Uh, slashed your wife's tires, right? Uh huh. Okay, so tell me about that. What happened? What happened was, I guess she never came home that night. And well, isn't she staying at your mom's or something at that point? Well, it all started was that she moved out with the children to Phyllis and John's house. So that and that's your mom and and dad. Yes, correct. And she um, basically moved into Phyllis and John's house, which is my parents, and. Um, she was doing her own thing. But at that I, point, you guys were kind of still trying to maybe we were trying to mend, We were trying to mend the marriage. Right. So she goes and stays with your parents, with the kids. Yes. yes. And then you find out what? Um, that she is at a guy's house, I believe, somewhere in, I think, Bonita Springs, Florida, I'm assuming. Right. And so you go to that place at, what, 3 o'clock in the morning or something? I think there was a, a GPS on her vehicle. That's oh. how I knew. That's how I knew she was there. Got it. Okay. And you get there and you see her car. Right. And, and I happened? did. And I did the stupidest thing. By the biggest mistake of my life is I popped one of her tires. Okay. And it was on video. On video. Yeah. So she files this restraining order against you, and uh, this hearing is set. And you said, okay, I, represent me at the hearing, but I don't want a divorce. Correct. Okay. So the, the next time that we're talking, um, that night before the hearing on her restraining order against you. So now the court is supposed to decide whether or not to enter this restraining order against you. November 26, 2015. She shows up the night before. Between 12 and 2 in the morning. Right. Let's herself in with the key. Because mm -hmm. it's the marital home. You're there marital. by yourself at night. And yeah. you own a couple of restaurants. So it's normal for you to get home late. Yes. And she knew that you would always get home late. Yep. Always parked my car uh, outside. Never parked in the garage. Okay, so car's there. She knows you're there. Mm -hmm. She's by herself, lets herself into the house. And what happens? Thank God the video camera was rolling. You, you turn your phone on yeah, and you yeah. say, what are you doing here? What am I doing here? Prior to coming into the home, she uh, strolled to the kitchen. And that's when she went into the drawer and picked, uh, grabbed the steak knife. That's before she confronted me. So she went into the home and uh, went into the kitchen. I don't know if you, do you remember the video. Oh, I do. Uh, I, that, that's on video with her picking up the knife. You yes. had already turned on the video at that point. Yeah. Uh, so she p uh, picks, up the, uh, picks up the knife and she uh, goes into the bedroom where I was. And um, she started to ransack the home, uh, drawing my stuff uh, out of the closet, taking things off my desk uh, in my office with the, with the mail and stuff like that. Uh, saying that she stating that she is here for 
picking up Mason's ear medicine. And I, I don't know if you remember, keep in mind that uh, this is two in the morning. She's saying Mason uh, needed his eardrops, which uh, John is a doctor, which pres can prescribe Mason's ear medication. So uh, your, your father is a surgeon. Yes. She's staying at his home. Correct. Basically, we started ransacking the house, and uh, the next thing you know, um, I'm being attacked. So what does she do? She starts, like, grabbing at you? Grabbing at me, swinging at me, uh, which the knife is still in her possession. I grab hold of the knife, and... Um, now, now, meanwhile, I want to make sure that I say, on the video, you say, I'm being attacked. Yes. And she actually says, yep, you're being attacked. Being attacked. And uh, she knew she was on video. Uh, I stated a few times that I was being attacked. And um, I, pr I proceeded to uh, get away from her. I finally escorted myself uh, outside the marital home. And that's when I proceeded to call 911. Right. Police come. Police come. Um, meanwhile, now she followed me outside the home. So as the police were coming, I was outside the home. As soon as she went outside the home, I got myself back into the home and locked the doors. Uh, moments later, the police arrived. Um, and I'm watching this from inside. And um, the officers came into the home, saw all the markings. I don't know if you recall the markings on my neck, the markings on my face. And, and, and uh, on your chest and belly, too, like yeah. you sent us pictures. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I had markings on my chest, on my shoulders, and uh, the police uh, asked to see the video. I proceeded to show them the video, and uh, my soon-to-be ex-wife was detained and arrested. She was, she was arrested. Yes. Yeah. So, and so she gets arrested. She's, like, t led away in handcuffs, spends the night in jail, mm -hmm. right? Next morning, it's time for the hearing on her domestic violence injunction against you. And she's brought out of custody in the green jumpsuit. The green jumpsuit, yes. Having been arrested the night before. Correct. And so the judge was like, okay, we're dropping this. Yes, I think it was, um, it was tossed. It was thrown out of court. Correct. It was dismissed. And at that point, you said to me, okay, I'm ready to file for a divorce now. <laughs> that, that, I guess that was the icing on the cake. Yeah. <laughs> so we filed for divorce that day. We filed for divorce that day. And we asked for a custody evaluation, supervised time sharing, and all of that based on the fact that she now has... Uh, actually a no contact order against, or you have one against her at that point. Right, because of her arrest. Correct. So she's now not allowed to go near you, not allowed to go near the marital home. Correct. Right. So the next thing that happens is she calls you uh, at the restaurant. At the restaurant. And tells you to go look at her car go yes um she was having car trouble i believe she took her car to european motors on um i believe trade center way i was hesitant about going there the good-hearted guy i was i went there to basically pay for the uh whatever problem was going on with the car not knowing that um she was trying to set me up Right, so you go there, uh, it's, it's closed at the time, I think, right? So you-, you No, check. they were open. Oh, they were open, but you look at the car. You, you go and you look at the car. Yes. Okay, and, and that's it. You were with your cousin. I was with my cousin. And your cousin, Rich, is uh, also a partner in, your, in one of your restaurants. Yes, and he's also one, uh, my son's godfather. Right. One of your best friends, but he's also your cousin. He's also your business partner in yes. one of the restaurants. Yes. So you go do that. Next thing we know, 
her first lawyer is fired. She hires a new lawyer. And lo and behold, you get a new injunction filed against you. Absolutely. Again. Uh huh. And it's for what? It's for going to look at the car. Uh, going to going to look at the car at the uh, at the European Motor Motor Works. Right. Uh, and then she also threw in some extra things like that you had the GPS. The, the GPS, but you know there were other things that she didn't didn't include in her first one, like that there had been pot in the house at one point. Okay, yes, so, uh, she brought up uh, marijuana, alcohol, pills. Um, uh, that you had thrown her cell phone like four years before or something. Like she just threw in all these extra things. I was being uh, labeled as an alcoholic, uh, drug abuse, child beater, wife beater. Right. So, and then this time the injunctions against you, and I mean, for the kids as well. Yes. So now you don't even get to see your kids at this point. Um, well, prior to that injunction being placed that um, uh, I guess she was doing this without our awareness. And then that late evening coming home from work, I had a, a sheriff's office come to the door telling me I had 20 minutes to vacate the marital home. Which was kind of crazy because she wasn't allowed at the marital home either at that point. Correct. So she moves back into the marital home when there's actually an injunction against her for being at the marital home. Yes, and, and technically she's in violation of being in that marital home. Correct, correct. So, but then mysteriously, a few days later, the state attorney drops the case against her. Absolutely. And we had no idea why. No idea why. Yeah, they just said, that's it, we're dropping the case. So we suspected that her attorney at the time had some kind of connection with the state attorney's office and got it dropped. That's what we expected. Right. So now, there's nothing against her anymore. It's only against you. Correct. So we go to a hearing on December 16th. We don't finish. We go back on December 18th. We don't finish again. Now it gets reset for March 9th. And this is all on this temporary injunction where there's actually no, there's been no hearing on any of her charges whatsoever yet. Absolutely nothing. Right. She just files this thing. She gets this injunction against you. And now it's like going to be three months before you even get to have a say about this hearing. Right. Yep. So before, so in February, February 3rd, her second attorney dies. Unexpectedly. Dies unexpectedly. Mm -hmm. So the next thing that happens is I get a call. Paul's being arrested for violating this injunction that doesn't even have we haven't even had a hearing on the merits of of this injunction yet but you're being violated on it yes okay so tell us about that she claimed that i supposedly went to the marital home uh looking through her windows which was not the case i get violated for uh supposedly uh um going into the uh indigo lakes and uh go looking in in the windows of the marital home and, and the violation is, is precipitated by uh, an affidavit that was filed by a private investigator named Chris Knott, who files this injunction and says, you know, and files this affidavit and says, he saw you do it. Yes. Right? Correct. And... Um, and so they, they arrest you. They, they arrest me. 
And I, I went, I spent, I think that, uh, this was the first, in, uh, first arrest. I spent, uh, I think two nights in jail on, on that charge. Yeah. Of, viola of violating. So here you are, you're being violated for an injunction that no one has, ha has even heard the merits on yet. Correct. Okay, so then March 9th, we are supposed to have this hearing and finally have it on the in merits of the injunction. And she doesn't have a new lawyer yet, allegedly. Right? Correct. Correct. She had an inter intern, uh, interim lawyer. Yeah, so two lawyers come forward and say that they're hired just to file the continuance. Uh, Tony Perez and Cynthia Hall. So meanwhile, her lawyer has been dead for a month, but she says she doesn't have a new lawyer yet. Correct. So we finally get to a hearing around March 16th or something. And she says, shows all kinds of pictures of her being bruised and stuff. And the injunction gets entered. The, yeah, the injunction was granted. So the next thing that happens is I took a look at her arrest picture. Do you remember this? I remember this so clearly. Okay, so tell, tell, tell us about that. You uh, got a picture of her, I believe her mugshot. She claimed that um, I, I believe bruised her face or her eye. And when you were looking at her mugshot, there was no de definitive markings on her face whatsoever. Right, so there was a difference between the pictures that she showed at the hearing and her mugshot. Correct. And of course, I didn't have a picture of her mugshot at the hearing. So there was no way that I could know that until after. So we file a motion for rehearing and reconsideration. Correct. So, and meanwhile, you're supposed to be doing supervised visitation with your kids all this time, right? Yeah, I mean, um, but you didn't want to do it because I didn't want to put my kids through any, any of the nightmare that I was going through. And, uh, I just felt morally, it wasn't the right thing to do. And your kids were how old at this time? Like seven and 13 or something like that, right? Yeah, about uh, six and 12, seven and 13, give or take. Yeah, yeah. So we go to a motion for rehearing in May. Uh, and by that time, we had hired Donald Day. Donald Day. Okay, as, as your criminal attorney. Yes. And we get the motion for rehearing granted. Absolutely. Okay. So the next thing that happens is you get arrested again. Arrested again. And what are you arrested for again now this time? I'm arrested for cyber stalking. Well, and more than that, I, I mean, so, okay. So just so I can explain this to, to people who are listening, your motion for rehearing and reconsideration is granted. All that meant was that we were gonna do another hearing on the merits of your injunction so that we can explain to the judge why that injunction should be dropped. So that hearing is, ends up being set for like July. So we're still waiting. We're still, you still have this injunction against you that shouldn't have been filed in the first place. In May, we get this motion for rehearing and reconsideration. So we're finally getting somewhere. We're starting to gain steam. We're starting to gain some steam. And I should mention, who was it that was paying for all of your wife's attorney's fees? Phyllis and John, which were my parents. And why were they doing that? Um, they were doing that so they can have uh, full control over the children. So, but what was, 
let's just go back a little bit and talk about the dynamic with your mother and because I, I think this is really important at this juncture because we also I, there's something else that happened in March that I want to make sure that we mention. Let's go back and talk about the dynamic between your parents and, and your, you and your brother and sister. Your parents have t- traditionally supported everybody, right? Everybody. And you have become successful and decided you didn't need their help anymore. No. I, I wanted to, I, I wanted to branch out. I guess I didn't want to be controlled anymore. I wanted to be my own person, my own identity. And talk about your mother for a little bit. What's her um, personality type? Dr. Hansen called it right where it, right what it is. She thinks she's the godfather of the family, uh, controlling. Um, she has to be involved with everyone else's business. If you cross her, it's uh, it's the ultimate sin. Um, she wanted to be the, that face of the family. So the fact that you didn't want her involved in your marriage or your children, she, how did she take that? I didn't want her involved with my, my family anymore. Uh, it was that control issue. Uh, uh, you know, she why she was telling my children what to do, what to wear, uh, what school to go to, what time to be in bed. And hadn't she at one point, like maybe a year, two years before the divorce started, filed or, 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 or threatened to file or maybe did file some papers to try to get custody? She tried to file a temporary custody order uh, behind uh, my ex-wife and m- myself uh, without us knowing. Right. So she's trying to get the kids away from you. Trying to get the kids away from both of us. Right. And um, why was she doing that? I guess the only thing I can probably think of today is um, she was doing that to save her marriage. And what was going on in her marriage? Her husband was having an affair with a nurse at the hospital, I believe. What did she do to that nurse, by the way? What didn't she do? (laughs) Um, She stalked her. She uh, slashed her tires. She um, had her sister involved at one point, uh, threatening phone calls. Um, I believe there was an injunction filed against her from uh, this nurse. She was harassing her, showing up at uh, the hospital unannounced, showing up at uh, this woman's house. So, yeah. And so going back to what was she doing with your kids, even while your marriage was still intact, didn't your parents give your older son like a burner phone or something like that? Yes, Phyllis and John gave a throwaway phone, which I'm sure we, we call it the burner phone, and told him, don't tell your parents that we gave you this phone so you can contact us because we told our, we told our kids at the time that um, we wanted to get some kind of our independent family stable and stability before uh, allowing them to see the grandparents again. So you were trying to put up boundaries. Correct. And have healthy boundaries. And, and Phyllis wasn't having that. They weren't having it whatsoever. Yeah. They, at one point, I believe they gave Justin a tape recorder as well to uh, record our conversations. So your wife at, at some point just decided if you can't beat them, join them. That's probably the correct terminology. Yeah. He jumped ship. Right. So uh, in March, before we had the hearing, your mother leaves you a voicemail. I believe, I, I believe the voicemail was on my way to the hearing. And what did that say? You know, I still have that voicemail. <laughs> I need a copy of that voicemail, unless I, I might have it, but I, you need to send that to me. Um, <laughs> um, basically, that voicemail was a threatening voicemail saying that uh, she's going to do whatever it takes to uh, 
basically defend her grandchildren. Can I play it? Yeah, please do. Cool. This is Mom. Listen, I don't care what you think of me, but what you are doing to these kids is terrible. Doreen oh, has no problem with you seeing the kids, <clears throat> taking them to dinner, doing things with them, taking them on a little vacation to so-called Disney. But these kids do not want to sleep over. Mason is afraid. He's afraid of everything. You are ruining their lives. So I'm going to make you this one offer and one offer only. If you continue to destroy these kids, how far they have come, I am calling the district attorney's office this afternoon. I am giving them the papers about Tetra, and I am going to report it to the district attorney and Homeland Security. You have a federal, you have a case coming up soon. And that's all the district attorney needs to get a hold of. So unless you're smart enough and stop thinking about getting back at Doreen through the kids, I suggest you listen and listen very carefully because I am not going to take this anymore. I already called the district attorney's office and I have a phone call into him. Don't let me have to do this, Paul, because I will do it. So think twice about what you're doing. Love, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> is that chilling or what i mean i, I get the I, I get the chills listening to that oh my god it's like i can't even believe that she had the nerve to put that on a, a, a tape and <laughs> and that that recording that message came as as i was being driven to the courthouse to face i guess the first charge well the, to finally have a hearing yeah. Um, it was like in March, it was, so it's like three or four months later to finally finish the hearing on the merits of whether or not you should have this injunction. And, and um, I, uh, I believe that message was sent because she knew we were gaining momentum. Right. And, and uh, um, she was going to do whatever it takes to um, bring up these false allegations. Well, include helping your wife doctor photos to present in court. Correct. Okay, so that was in March. So in May, um, we finally get the motion for rehearing uh, granted based on the fact that it was obvious that the, the pictures were fake. Fake. At some point in this, during this period of time, we start to suspect, oh, I know what it was. I actually saw Doreen at a restaurant with Chris Knott's uh, private investigator partner. Mike Pearl. Mike Pearl. I saw her with him at a restaurant. Yeah. And I was like, okay, that's kind of weird. Why is she out with the, these private investigators, like, socializing? Yes. So we hire a private investigator to see what's going on with her and, and these, because initially we thought maybe she was having uh, a romantic relationship with Mike Pearl. Correct. So we hire Al Perez, who's a private investigator. Yep. And what and does he find? I believe you had to reach out to him um, from another district because of the conflict. Yes, because they had already hired the ones that I normally used in Collier County. Yes. So we hire Al Perez, who's up in Lee County, and what does he find? Um, the explosive bombshell is she's having um, an affair with Chris Knott. The private investigator who had filed the affidavit. Filed two false affidavits against me and having me arrested twice. Okay, well, we haven't even, let's finish oh, the second oh. arrest. Yeah, so the second arrest in May is for doing what? Uh, cyber stalking. Well, not just cyber stalking. It was also going in his neighborhood. Oh, so, so, yes, yeah, cyber stalking and then uh, going into his neighborhood, uh, supposedly me following his, uh, being around his home or his family members. And what was his basis for saying that? 
Because wasn't he seeing, like you have, so you own a restaurant that has like- A uh, delivery service. A delivery service. And he, and the, and one of the cars or a couple of the cars have like, they're Deli wrapped so that they have the name of the restaurant and everything on them, right? Correct. So he saw the car- The car going by his home. That had your, your restaurant name on it. Correct. Because you, you know, people were doing deliveries. Right. Do you ever do your own deliveries? Yes. Well, not not all the. I mean, today sometimes yes, but back back then no. I'm fully managing the restaurants. Yeah. So you weren't in his neighborhood. I was not in his neighborhood. But he. So let's talk about Chris Knott for a second. Chris Knott was a private investigator. What else was he? Former. He was a former Kyler County Sheriff's Office. And what happened to him there? He was fired from the Kyla. Well, we found out, or you found out, that he was fired from the Kyla County Sheriff's Office for uh, sexual harassment and his misconduct towards uh, some uh, some females at a restaurant in the parking lot. Yeah, so he's fired for inappropriate behavior for misconduct from the Kyla County Sheriff's Office. Yes. But we also found out that he still had ties and friends. In the police force. Uh, yes, and also in the state attorney's office. Correct. That there were certain state attorneys high up that he uh, was getting to do things for him. Yes. So you get arrested again in May or June of 2016 for allegedly stalking Chris Knott. Correct, cyber stalking. And now it's a second violation. Second violation. I call it the, uh, the spear that destroyed me for quite some time. And that one you were, you were arrested where? Uh, in the restaurant in front of all my customers. And as you're being led to the police car, you look up and what do you see? Chris Knott in his vehicle, uh, honking the horn, basically saying, I got you. Waving, smiling, laughing. And laughing. And because you're violating it a second time, how long did you have to spend in jail that time? 13 days. And Donald Day is representing you for that as well. Yes. But this all, oh, I remember actually, this happened like on Friday before Memorial Day weekend. Correct. So we couldn't even do anything until the following week. Correct. Yeah. So then Donald Day, gets the charges dropped or something, right? I had, to, I had to take a plea deal for the first injunction or the first violation so he can get me out on the second violation. And what was the plea deal? Uh, I, had to plead, I had to plead guilty on the violation of the injunction on the first uh, one that we didn't even get into court to defend ourselves. And, and the first one, of course, was the bogus- The bogus- uh, <laughs> Affidavit by her boyfriend. Correct. Who was married at the time, by the way. Married with three children. Yeah. So that happens. And the next thing that happens while we're still waiting to get the heat rehearing is now you get another injunction slapped on you for the kids, for what? Because, oh, I know what happened. So in March, she hires another lawyer. Correct. And this guy and I are actually able to get, uh, we got 50-50 time sharing done. Yes. So you start doing your 50-50 time sharing at that point. So Correct. So um, we, we tried to settle the rest of the case. We don't get the rest of the case settled, but we do get 50-50 done. Correct. 
correct. So for, for, from March through June, you're seeing the kids half the time. Correct. So then what happens after you do the plea deal and then we're still oh, prior, to the hearing? Uh, prior to me, prior to you getting that 50-50 parenting plan, I didn't see my children for almost 18 months. No, 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 no. That was the next time. This is just three months. You didn't see them from December to March. Right. So I didn't see them for three months. Three okay. months. Go ahead. Yeah, because I still have that picture of you taking them to the baseball game uh, the first time you had seen them and it had been three months. Correct. Yeah. Um, do you remember that picture? Is, was that the one when uh, they're both sitting, we're sitting uh, yes. in his, the Boston Red Sox, I think? Yes. Yeah, yes. yeah. Yeah. Yes. So, okay. So now you hadn't seen them in three months, but now you've at least, you've been seeing them regularly from March to June. And in June, what happens? It was Father's Day, I believe. Yes. And I took the children to um, up in Cape Coral. It was like some kind of a water park. Uh, or zip something. lighting. Zip lighting. Oh, zip lighting. That's what it was. Yes. I took them zip lighting in um, somewhere in, up in northern Florida, somewhere. I don't know the exact location. And um, it was Father's Day weekend and all having a great time. And we come back so that we came back on, uh, we came back that Sunday night. And then I believe Monday was the transfer day where uh, the mom gets the chill, uh, gets her time sharing. That's when the nightmare began. Uh, I was- uh, <laughs> Continued. <laughs> uh, the, um, I believe there was a injunction filed of, a child abuse claim. Yeah. And let's just talk about that for a second, because you had been very much against any kind of corporal punishment up until this claim, right? Correct. Uh, and everybody knew it. Everybody knew it. Phyllis and John, uh, I, I think, uh, I believe the pediatrician knew that I was against corporal punishment. And you, your wife even told the custody evaluator that you were always against it. Correct. Because when you were growing up, tell about this thing that was hanging in your house, this wooden uh, spoon. The wooden spoon. So there was this wooden spoon hanging in your house. Then what did your parents do with it? They used to beat us with it. They used to hit us with it. And your brother and sister also have wooden spoons hanging in their homes, right? Correct. And, and what was your position on that? There was no wooden spoons in my house. Because why? Um, I didn't like it and I was against corporal punishment. And so you had never laid a hand on your kids? Never ever touched my children. So in the middle of all this craziness, while we're still waiting for your hearing on our motion for rehearing on the bogus whole other thing, all of a sudden you've become a child beater. I become the child beater. And so they attached pictures that said you had done what to your younger child? That I beat, I, that I beat Mason with, I think, a, was it a belt? Yes. Yes. And they had like pictures on his leg or something. Legs, back, arms, which uh, as you, I think if you remember the pictures, there was no, they were black and white, couldn't see nothing. Um, you couldn't even tell if it was his leg. Yes. It could have been anybody's leg. <laughs> and it was like something on his back too, something on his back. Yeah. Right. So now we're, we're dealing with that now too. And um, so uh, we go to the hearing on that, and lo and behold, another new lawyer. Another new lawyer. Was that number five? Yeah, I think so. So now she's hired Herman Tarnow, right? Correct. Or I should say Phyllis hired Herman Tarnow. Phyllis hired Herman Tarnow. Right, and the reason why Phyllis hired him was because why? 
she didn't like what she was hearing from Kernick. She didn't like the fact that Kernick had gotten you a 50-50 deal. Yeah. And plus, wasn't uh, Herman Tarnow one of your dad's patients or something? Correct. They were doing a barter system. Yeah. So and going back, back to Kernick as well, Kernick was involved. Kernick, ironically, shirts, shared an office, or Chris Knott served an office with Kernick. That's right. That's right. I remember that now. So, but meanwhile, Phyllis is like leaving all these lawyers with unpaid bills. Um, so, but she did, I, I think she had done some sort of trade with, with uh, Chris Knott as well, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So anyway, uh, oh, by the way, we didn't mention what Al Perez found the bombshell video with Chris Knott. That's when it all made sense, is uh, where uh, Doreen was having an affair with uh, Mr. Knott. So we get the private investigator to follow them, mm -hmm. and they come out of a bar, and what happens? I think they started making out on the motorcycle. Yeah, right yeah. on video. Right on video. Yep. And she had like grabbed his face and like, yeah. you know, the whole thing was like very obvious. It was very obvious. I remember the day that that video came in, everyone in my law firm, we all watched it together, like with like popcorn, basically like, oh my God, you know? I believe that, I believe that was probably the turning point of the case. I think, I think that's, well, I, I that's think, when think, we all started to realize what the hell was going on. I guess, yeah, I think that's when you figured out why these injunctions kept uh, coming into play. And I actually contacted uh, the private investigators bureau, whoever governs them. Uh, it was like um, it, it, Department of Licensing and Agriculture or something. And I had spoken to some guy who was like, had been investigating Chris Knott and wrongdoing for a long time. Yes. And he wanted to go after him. I think we decided to kind of wait because we didn't want backlash or something. We wanted this divorce to be done first or something. Yes. Um, but, you know, I mean, so this was like at a very high level. I mean, we had crooked state attorneys crooked cops who are willing to arrest you on nothing. Um, you know, at this point, it's just like, you're just feeling like, how? Like, how are you feeling at this point? Words can't even describe it. It was just such a train wreck. I felt like, um, like the way uh, that I felt like I was fighting an army, uh, that I couldn't even find a chance to breathe, a chance to, uh, I didn't even know what was going on. Um, I was being attacked on all different levels. Every time I turned around, it was something. Uh, I guess the frustration was just growing and growing. I mean, uh, I remember times when you were lecturing me, uh, we'll have our day in court, we'll get there. Um, horrible. I never, ever want to live that moment again. It was probably one of the uh, darkest days of my life. I mean, I remember going to see you in jail the second time. Yep. And you were just, you know, like broken, basically. Unbelievable. I, broken. Yeah. I mean, I just remember you like sobbing, saying, this is not me. I, how did I get here? Like, here you are, you know, successful re restaurateur. You've got your life is under control. You've got... Um, two kids, a nice home, you know, you're making it for yourself and this is what's happening. And your own mother, who's a malignant narcissist. Orchestrating this whole thing. Orchestrating this whole thing. And what did I tell you at that point? <sighs> um, hang in there. Uh, let me get us into the courtroom. Let me get us uh, 
we'll get there. You told me, uh, I remember those words, you telling me that um, uh, we'll have our day in court. Uh, let me guide you there, let me get you there, and uh, uh, we'll get to tell our side of the story. And hang in there. Yeah, yeah, don't give up. Don't give up, you believed in me 100%. Yeah. And I remember saying, you have to believe you can win. Yep. If you and I, think, I think you told me at one point we are going to win. Yeah. And, but I said, you had to believe it too. Yep. So we're in June. Now you have this second injunction uh, or and now it's an injunction on the kids and we have the motion for rehearing set for like August or something. And that's where Herman Tarnow shows up. Yeah. I think we actually have that motion for rehearing at that point. But I, I think what happens is judge Evans at that point decides she's just going to set it for trial yes. and, do, and do everything at once. Correct. Okay. So it, trial is supposed to be set for like December or something. Mm -hmm. And um, what happened there? It just continued to get continued. It just continued after continued. And I believe Donald Day was still uh, in the picture at the time. Right. Right. So he does that motion for rehearing and we present all of our evidence and it looks like we're going to win that. We had a hearing that summer. I remember going there and seeing Herman and at the time, he was like trying to get you to sign something. Because during this whole period, we were also trying to get, I think I was trying to get her to sign off on refinancing this balloon payment or something. Because at the time, you're also trying to deal with stuff that's going on with the business and the building and, um, and, and that sort of thing. And we're also trying to sell the house at this point. Correct. And, and while she's trying to sell the house, or while we're trying to sell the house, she is um, sabotaging every, uh, every sale that's coming through that home. Right. So, I mean, like dog poop on the, uh, you know, living room floor that the realtor is having to pick up. So the hearing gets reset for November. So everything just continues to get pushed back. And meanwhile, you're supposed to have like supervised time sharing with your kids. We agree somewhere in September, October to uh, Dr. Hansen being yes. um, the yeah. custody evaluator. So now everything gets pushed back because we're waiting for the custody evaluation. So the custody evaluation comes out in like March, I want to say, of 2017, somewhere in there. And what does that say? I, I believe it said everything that we've been saying all along. I remember something that stands out, and I still remember it to this day. It said something that uh, Miss Landy and the paternal grandmother has, has risen above the domestic violence in this courtroom. Alienation has occurred. Mm -hmm. it, the, uh, they dwarfed and uh, the relationship between the father and son. Basically, didn't it say your mother was like the godfather of the family? Of the family yes. <clears throat> and that she was the one that had caused the problems? Yes, it was adding fuel to the fire. So what does she recommend with regard to your children and your parents? No contact. Right. She recommends no contact. There is considerable concern about the grandparents' involvement, most notably the grandmother's involvement. She is toxic in her disdain for her son and is likely a strong player in the over-litigation that has occurred in this case. She is funding Ms. Landy's legal battle and is adamant to keep the grandchildren from Mr. Landy from all accounts of the collaterals. She is likened to the quote-unquote godfather with her need for control over her family members and Mr. Landy committed the unforgivable sin by excommunicating with her. She also attempts to buy the children by promising them material goods if they are good for their mom, do not give their mother a hard time. Uh, both children are very aware of her disdain for their father and have cited several examples of her speaking poorly of him. 
Uh, she's paying for the mother's legal fees. So his behavior is nothing compared to the wife's. Needless to say, there needs to be strict boundaries on the Landy's, Landy grandparents' involvement with Justin and Mason. So we end up going to trial in April of 2017. And it's a six day trial. And what happens at trial? What I took out of that trial was, uh, it was amazing how um, I was on the stand for hours upon hours. And I don't know, I, I think you would recall this. Doreen was only on the stand for maybe 15 minutes or 30 minutes out of the whole trial. And uh, um, I think that's something the judge pointed out too during the trial was um, that she didn't speak too much. She didn't say too much. I thought you were brilliant on how you handled it. I mean, absolutely brilliant. Um, the one thing that stands out the most was, uh, which I think hit the judge hard was you showing me uh, Mason's Father's Day card to me, I think. And I think that's when I broke. Do you remember that day? You remember that day? Of course. I felt that um, uh, you and John were brilliant. There's so many things that happened that day. It was just so stressful, so emotional. I think I remember telling you guys on the way down to the uh, to the trial that I think you remember, I says, I, I looked at you both, said, whatever happens, I thank you guys. And I knew we were going to win. I just knew it. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the things that I remember is that during the trial, the wife had lied about something on a Tuesday or a Wednesday or something, something with DCF, because DCF yeah. had been um, like visiting you or something. R remind me what that was, because I remember thinking, like pointing out to the judge which was it, you know, like, so remind me about that. Um, that's when DCF uh, showed up at uh, the wife's home and uh, she, she did not let DCF interview the children. But there was something about her saying it's, they, something had happened on a Tuesday night or something but she was supposed to have the kids that night. Like if you looked at the schedule and then she said that she couldn't take them or something like, and, and I remember saying like, well, if you couldn't take them, like if you were so worried about like, cause it was like the Tuesday after- There was something, there was something inconsistent with her, the timeline. Right, so Sunday is when she says this all happened with Mason. Correct. Tuesday, she sends them back to you. No, Sunday it happened. No, she Something sent like them back. She sent them back to me on Wednesday because that's okay. the. So Sunday it happened. Monday and Tuesday, there was no issues, and then Wednesday she sent the kids back to me. Right, and. But then, like, I was, like, saying something like, I remember her saying, like, she couldn't take the kids or something. And I was like, well, which is it? Like, why are you sending them back to him if they had just been beaten that, like, and it was actually only one of the kids. It wasn't even both. Right. It was, it was just the youngest child. Right. But somehow you weren't allowed to see the older one either. Correct. But she had lied about something that had happened and the timeline was totally off. Yes. Um, and so we caught her in that lie as well. Correct. So anyway, we have the six day trial and she only testifies for like 15 minutes. We have, we call your parents, both your parents your brother, who is fully on the Phyllis and John payroll, right? Yep, the gravy train. Yep. So he's not going against his the spoon that feeds his mouth. Yes. And then we call Chris Knott, 
Talk about that testimony. Supposedly all these allegations against me, all these recordings, all these tapes, and uh, uh, he couldn't prove anything. I, I believe he told the courts that uh, he destroyed all the evidence. Correct. He destroyed all the evidence. Yes. And why did he say he destroyed it all? I believe there was nothing to show, saying that there was nothing I did. Yeah. There was no concrete evidence of me doing anything. Yeah. So um, he, and then at the end, the last question that we asked of him was what? The last question was, are you having a sexual relationship with uh, Dorian Landy? Yeah. And his answer was? Yes. And that was the, the last of his. No further questions, Your Honor. Yeah. I mean, how crazy is that? And I mean, he admitted to writing this affidavit while he was having a sexual relationship with her. So therefore, you had gone through all this, right, for, for nothing, basically, just because your mother had orchestrated. Oh, and who was paying for Chris Knott, the private investigator's uh, bill. Phyllis and John. What was the outcome of the trial? We won. Uh, the judge saw through all the uh, all the BS. It was a bittersweet moment, I would say. It took her a while to rule, but when she did, uh, we were victorious. Like I told you, you guys were brilliant, brilliant. So you ended up getting what? Ultimate decision making. 50% time sharing. 50%, but lots of supervised stuff on her because yes. she wasn't allowed to do what? I got a lot of time back uh, with me and the boys. She wasn't allowed to see the children for an extended period of time. And uh, your parents weren't allowed to see them? Uh, no contact order until uh, me and my ex-wife come up to an agreement. And it's still in, it's still in place as of today. Yeah, and, and there were therapists appointed for the children. Yes. And um, Dr. Hansen had to be, you know, come back in and testify again like a year later, right? Correct. And what, what was she testifying on? My ex-wife violating the uh, grandparents' uh, order of not seeing the children. In the end, you also ended up with what with regard to your restaurants and the building and everything? Everything was awarded to me. You got everything. Everything. And so I, are they still trying to get at you now? Yes. <laughs> what are they doing now? The, wit the witch hunt will always continue on their end. They're trying to get me for child support right now. Yeah, it was a modified the child support. Mod modified child support. But that's all they have anymore. That's all they have anymore. And, uh, um, our last hearing, um, nothing happened. We're still waiting on uh, another hearing, as what we call it is they, all they have is smoke and mirrors. Did you have to pay any of her attorney's fees or anything like that? No. No. So uh, did you have to pay her alimony? Um, I think that uh, it was called a bridge the gap alimony. And all she got was we, I think we shared an account that had like, Seventeen, eighteen thousand dollars in it, and uh, the judge just told me to do the right thing, so I just gave her whatever was there. So uh, um, out of this whole thing, she got eighteen thousand dollars or seventeen thousand. And that's it. That was it. So in the end, karma won out. Karma won out. Um, I, I strongly believe there's. There's no winners or losers. I mean, uh, you know, there's it's going to be scarred for life, uh, no matter which way you look at it. My boys are going to be scarred for life. Um, but at the end of the day, you you gave me my life. I mean, I didn't have to start over. Um, um, I'm still successful. I'm still going stronger than ever. You're like my role model. I mean, you gave me that confidence to move on. Um, I think about you guys all the time. Like I'm indebted to you guys. I mean, every time I go somewhere, every time I'm in with, uh, um, the attorney who you appointed me now, um, I'm always talking about you guys. Uh, you guys done wonders for me.
Thank you. I really, really appreciate that. It's like the U.S. currency, like in God we trust. I would say in Rebecca we trust. You guided me as a mother figure, as a friend, as a lawyer. I don't think I could have done it without you. Um, you became that the rock that I needed at that timing. You became that focal point for me. Um, more or less, I mean, I strongly believe, I mean, I look at you as that mother figure. You know, you took me by the hand. You guided me. I listened to you. I know times were bad at times. I wanted to give up, um, but you kept you kept me strong. You kept me straight and narrow. I'm indebted for you for life. I mean, uh, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think about what you've done. You gave me that motivation. You gave me that spark. With all the people out there listening, you've got to get Rebecca's program. It will save your life. At the end of the day, she is going to help you. And she helped me great deal. So today I am talking about something that I don't necessarily uh, enjoy talking about, and that's malignant narcissists. And malignant narcissists have an overlay of being a sociopath. And so they can tend to be violent, have threats of violence, and often can be dangerous. And I have seen it a lot in my practice, you know, when I was practicing family law, uh, actively and saw them threaten. And so I want to talk about the signs that I saw just, you know, in the video with Gabby Petito. And I also saw when you hear about the interviews with her friend and some of the other signs leading up to the fact that she ended up, unfortunately, no longer with us. And it's, it's so, so tragic, especially in light of the fact that there was this interview with the police just days before she ended up, unfortunately, being found dead. And, and as a mother myself, as a mother of, of two daughters, I have four children, I have two daughters and two sons, but I also you know, have a daughter who happens to be 19. And I look at her and I see my daughter and I just it's absolutely heartbreaking. It's absolutely tragic. And I can only imagine how heartbreaking it must be for her parents to, to know that she was so close to being safe right there with the police. So, you know, just going back and giving a little bit of history of this case for those of you who don't know that much about it, this case basically kind of takes place between July and September of 2021. That was when this young couple, they set out to take this trip in this white van, this white Ford Sprinter. We have Gabby Petito, who's 22 years old, her boyfriend, Brian Laundry, who's 23 years old. They were engaged. They had been engaged since July of 2020. There's actually some kind of back and forth about whether or not her parents even knew that they were still engaged. I guess she had told her parents that they were no longer engaged. He believed that they were still engaged. But anyway, they had lived with his parents, his family in Florida for about a year. And they decided to embark on this cross-country trip in this van that they had kind of converted into a camper. They start off by going north to New York. They visit her family and then they start heading west and they visit some national parks and they document their trip on social media through YouTube and through Instagram. Apparently they get into some sort of altercation and that happens on August 24th. So on August 24th, this couple spots them getting into some sort of an altercation where they see him slapping her. So they call the police. 911 is called. The police stop this van. And that's when you see this body cam video that's now been released. And, and anybody can go on YouTube and watch it. They pull them over. She's crying. She's upset. And there are all kinds of indications during that interaction that she's actually a victim of 
a, a narcissist. And when she gets out, she's crying. She immediately blames herself. I was the one, I was distracting him. You can see right away that she's blaming herself and she's upset and she's crying. And to the policeman's credit, you know, he's very calm with her, very kind, asks her to, you know, sit in the police car, says, you know, it's okay, you're not in trouble, you're fine. But you can see by her body language that she's afraid. She's actually terrified, terrified. She's, she's holding herself. She's making her small, herself small. She's scared. And by contrast, Brian is outside. He's open. He's breezily having a conversation with the police and calm, cool, collected, and talking with the police officers and totally fine. And in fact, what I find very interesting is when the police officers said something about, oh, maybe you are really the victim of the domestic assault. What does he do? He actually smiles, this big, wide smile. I, you know, and listen, if he were really a victim of domestic violence, would he really be smiling? Would he be so delighted? No, he would not. He would most certainly at least be neutral. He wouldn't be laughing. He wouldn't be smiling. I mean, so this is this is the the look of a narcissist. And then you know, there's so many red flags in this situation, but that was certainly a huge red flag, a massive, huge red flag. You know, the fact that she's blaming it all on herself, honestly, is a red flag to me. That is a huge red flag. The fact that she's crying, that she's scared, that she's blaming it all on herself, that is a huge red flag to me. Because honestly, I believe that she was afraid of backlash, that she was afraid that when they got back in that van and the police are gone, that he was going to freak out on her. This is all your fault. You are the ones that invited this. You caused the police to get involved. And she didn't want that to happen. So she was afraid whether it was going to be physical backlash or verbal backlash, emotional backlash, whatever it was going to be, that she was going to be punished later down the road. Why was she so scared? Why was she so terrified? Why was she in the back of that police car crying, sobbing, terrified? Was she terrified of the police officers? Clearly not. They were being very nice with her, very sweet with her, very calm with her. What was she so afraid of? Clearly, she was afraid of what was going to happen after this whole thing was over. So that was a huge red flag for me. As far as the boyfriend was concerned, how was he? Where was his concern for her? Was he saying anything about her? Was he worried about where she was? Was he worried about the fact that she was upset? Absolutely not. And by the way, she's blaming all of the altercation and everything on herself. Did he do that? No. Did he even say, oh, it was both of us. We had an altercation. No, he blamed it all on her too. She grabbed the wheel. She made me swerve. He threw her right under the bus as well. I mean, this is the mark of a narcissist. No problem telling the police she's the problem. Clearly no problem throwing her under the bus. Very, very narcissistic. Absolutely no conscience whatsoever. No concern for her, no concern for her future, no concern for the fact that she may be upset. And by the way, not even neutral. You know, not even the fact that, you know, he's like saying, hey, it's both of us. We got into an altercation. We were upset. None of that. Just it's her. Obviously, there are times when maybe it was both of them and maybe she was, you know, the aggressor too and blah, blah, blah. And maybe she was slapping back. But, you know, I believe that in, in this particular instance, having seen 
a lot of these types of cases that this was a situation where this was not one of those situations. I've seen situations where the the woman was, you know, right back in the face of the man and fighting back and partially the aggressor as well. This is not one of those situations. This was a huge red flag to me. And here's another red flag to me. The fact that she was saying things like, I'm trying to start a blog and I'm, I'm blogging and he doesn't think that I can do it. He doesn't believe I can do any of it. You know, he calls it her little blog. Those are also indications of a narcissist devaluing something that she's trying to do, jealous of her, that she's trying to do something, minimizing the fact that she's trying to do something, the fact that she's doing anything that may take the spotlight away from him. Also very, very narcissistic, jealous of anything that may take her away from him. Also very narcissistic. Also, the fact that her friend, Rose Davis, who's also 21 years old, one of her friends said that he was extremely jealous, that he was manipulative, that he was controlling, that they were having more and more frequent arguments, that he once took her identifications so that she couldn't go out to bars. He didn't approve of her relationships, that, that he was isolating her from her friends constantly jealous of her friends, worried about her leaving him, all very, very indicative of a, a narcissistic type of personality, dominating, controlling, manipulative. And these are the types of warning signs that you should be looking for when you are in a relationship and, you know, looking to see if maybe it's not the type of relationship that you should be in. Another huge red flag is after she disappears. So September 1st, he shows up back in Florida in the van. She's not with him. Where is she? And he's not talking. This love of his life, supposedly. And he's lawyering up and not saying a word. That's a huge red flag. Obviously, if he were concerned, oh my God, she disappeared. Wouldn't he be going, hey world, help me find her. Everybody help me find her, she's missing. But he's not doing that. And now all of a sudden he's gone too, by the way massive huge red flag and now of course the worst possible outcome it, you know she's dead so these are the types of of red flags that everyone should be looking for when you are in these types of relationships very very sad very very sad and especially because it was it was right there she was right there with the police and clearly something could have been done. You know, I, I don't know. Obviously the police had no, no grounds to hold her or no grounds to hold him at that time. But geez, you know, too bad that nobody was able to pull her aside at that point and say, hey, this is not a healthy relationship for you. Maybe it's time that you, you get out of this relationship. So I, I feel like it's important for all of us who have a voice, who have a platform to say, if you are in a relationship that is not safe, that is not serving you, to please call the domestic abuse hotline, to please go to your nearest shelter, that there is help for you out there. It, it is okay to go get that help. And I'm going to be making sure that I drop links below to the domestic abuse hotline. Go get the help that you need. Thank you very much. I have, along with many of you, been following the story of beautiful Gabby Petito. It has touched me in a very personal way because I have two daughters and one of my daughters is actually 
not that far apart in age from Gabby Petito. I have a 19 year old daughter who is beautiful blonde haired girl like Gabby in my heart. So much goes out to the Petito family. And I mean, gosh, she's, she's all of our daughters, isn't she? I mean, just beautiful and had her entire life ahead of her. And here she is wanting to just have a, a life wanting to get in a van and blog and do an Instagram and be on YouTube and have a boyfriend, do all the things that girls want to do. And she just fell into the hands of the wrong guy. So a guy who was very charming, I'm sure at the beginning, and they jumped into a van just so, you know, for those of you who don't know a lot of the story, they jumped into a van at the beginning of July, they were going across country. They were going to be blogging about their story and visiting national parks. And it was going to be fantastic. And it started off wonderfully. They were putting stuff on social media about all the wonderful things that they were doing. And turns out, not so great. Couple sees them fighting, sees him slapping her. They end up calling 911, the cops stop them in August. There's this body cam footage of how they were fighting. She's crying. I did actually a, a breakdown on that of how I think that he was actually a malignant narcissist. And I actually pointed out why I think he's a malignant narcissist in that video and the signs that I saw I'm actually going to be doing another whole video on, I think, all the things that the cops actually missed on that. But, you know, I believe that he was a malignant narcissist. And malignant narcissists, by the way, have an overlay of being a sociopath. They're much more dangerous. These are the guys, or women too, who have a tendency to be the stalkers, the, the ones that can turn violent, the ones that have threats of violence. And I have seen them in my practice, you know, when I was practicing family law on a full-time basis, I would see these people and this guy had those tendencies. So how I think that potentially this led to her murder was on August 27th, there was a, an explosive fight that happened at a Tex-Mex restaurant. It was at a place called the Mary Piglet's restaurant a Mexican cafe in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. A woman and her boyfriend were on vacation from New Orleans. They happened to be next to them at the restaurant, a woman named Nina Angelo and her boyfriend, Matt England. They were right next to them and they saw them fighting at a restaurant on August 27th at 1 p.m. A massive, huge, explosive fight where he... Ryan Laundry was fighting with the hostess and fighting with the manager and with the waitress and Gabby was crying and she abruptly leaves and she's standing outside on the sidewalk and crying and Brian goes in and out several times, at least four times and appears to be fighting with the manager, the hostess and the waitress aggressively arguing with them and appears to be fighting with them about money or the bill or something like that and back and forth. And at some point then after he leaves the last time, Gabby, who's very upset and crying, goes back in and apologizes for his behavior. And it's after that time, approximately four hours later after this argument, that Brian is seen driving the van by himself. And it's after this that there's this other blogger that you see talking about how this white van, their van, is seen at the campsite not far from where her body ends up being found. And the van is there and there's this, it's parked and the back door is open but somebody is inside and you see the back door just mysteriously close as somebody drives 
passed. And it's that same day, August 27th, that Gabby's mother receives this mysterious text message that says something like something about Stan. Can you help Stan? I keep getting his voicemails and missed calls, which refers to her grandfather. But her mother found it very odd because Gabby never referred to the grandfather by his first name. Uh, and then it was a few days later that she got another text message about them not having service. And Gabby's mother now believes that neither of those texts were actually from Gabby herself. So how could she have been murdered that day? Well, it's possible that he was super angry. We know that he was already in a rage. We know that he was already angry at the waitress, the hostess, and the manager, who were all women, by the way. He was already aggressive. He was already angry at them. He was felt disrespected in some way at that restaurant. And the reason why he kept going back in is because he was in this power struggle with these women at the restaurant. And you know how it is with narcissists. They're in this power struggle. They need to feel respected. They need to feel adulated. They need to have this feeling of superiority. And with narcissists, it's always winners and losers. It's always you're either for them or against them. And they need to have that respect. And especially in a public setting. So they have to have that appearance of being the winner, of course. And so here it is in this public setting where all the people, all the patrons are seeing him. And apparently he's in this power struggle and he's got this shame, right? And narcissists carry this deep sense of shame that they're constantly trying to cover up. And when that narcissistic injury, that shame gets triggered, that's when that narcissistic rage comes flying out and especially for malignant narcissists. So it gets directed at who's ever around them. And we know that Gabby was already upset. Who knows if the two of them were already fighting about something separate, why she was hysterically crying. I don't know if they were already upset about something else or if she was upset about something at the restaurant, but she was already hysterically crying, at least according to this couple. And we know that they were already having a hard time because they were fighting, you know, just weeks before. And so the fact that she then went inside and apologized on his behalf to the restaurant people and then went back out to him would have been absolutely the worst thing that she could have done. Now, I'm sure from her perspective, she didn't do it to disrespect him. I'm sure from her perspective, it was just, she felt terrible for them. The fact that he may have been horrible to them. She probably just felt bad for them. She's probably a very empathic person, empathetic person. She probably just wanted to smooth it over. But from his perspective, you're either for me or against me. And if you're for them, you're against me. And he may have thought, how dare you? And to him, that may have been, you need to be punished for that. And that may have been the absolute straw and so when they got back into that van for him, that may have been something that she may have had some, that, that may have been the thing that caused the final straw, you know, and, and who knows, he, she may have even said at that point, I don't want to be with you anymore. I'm done with this relationship. And that may have been a straw too. Who knows? And, you know, why didn't she reach out for help? It could have been that because the cops weren't of any help to her just a couple of weeks before that she didn't feel that they were going to be of any help. 
he sat there and charmed them. So she felt, well, he's probably just going to charm them again. I mean, the one cop said, oh, maybe you're the victim of domestic violence. And he sat there and smiled. I talked about that in my other video. So from her perspective, she's probably thinking, well, there's no reason for me to reach out to them because they're of no help, right? From his perspective, you know, he's got this very fragile ego. It was already triggered. He was already upset. He was already in a rage. She goes back in. She apologizes on his behalf. Boom. That was probably not a good thing for her to do. Um, from his perspective, he may have said, that's it. You're done. You've got to pay. So I do want to just address if you are in a situation where you are unsafe, where you are, you do need to get out. I am going to post the domestic violence phone numbers again, just as I did in my last video. You do need to get out. I do want you to have a plan for your escape, as I mentioned before, so that you don't ever have to return because it is absolutely much worse if you do have to return. So if you can, if you can have a stash of cash, that would be ideal. It would be ideal if you have at least enough to last you a couple of months, a stash of cash that is your own in your own name in a bank account that no one else has access to. That would be perfect. If, if you have a place to go that is safe, that is ideal. If you don't have a place to go that you can stay that is safe, try to get yourself to a shelter. Usually there are shelters in your area. Try to get yourself to one. If you have children, have a plan for your children. Figure out what you're going to do with them. And if you can have a credit card in your own name, that would be ideal. And if you were going to hire a lawyer, now would be a good time to do that. If you decide that that is something that you want to do, have the lawyer hired ahead of time and then make a plan with your lawyer as far as if you are planning to file for divorce, where and when you want to serve this person with divorce papers or not. And if you're planning to serve this person with a restraining order or something like that, figure out all of the logistics ahead of time with that as well. So those are my thoughts on creating a safe plan. If you are in this situation, please, please, please have a plan before you get, you know, you decide to, to get to safety, but then please get to safety. What are your thoughts on the opposing side's tactic was to leave, set criminal charges, huge published smear campaigns, all for the purpose of separation. Uh, what's your opinion for best defense? Well, you've heard the, first of all, let me just tell you, I'm so sorry of what you're going through. It sounds like you're dealing with a malignant narcissist. Malignant narcissists tend to be the ones who are, um, you know, they don't even care. They have no conscience whatsoever. They'll just go after you and they'll say whatever they need to say. So what I'm gonna say to you, Al, is your best defense is a good offense. Uh, for those of you who follow me regularly, you know that I often say that the best football teams, if they have a great defense, then they have nobody scoring any points. So you need to start going on the offensive. This is a person who has gotten you under siege. And that's what narcissists do. Like right out of the gate, they want to take that first swing. They want to make sure that you feel disempowered, that you feel like you can't ever get past all of this. I have had clients who have had criminal charges against them, who haven't seen their children for years. All of this bad stuff has happened to them. And then they come to my office and we get it all turned around. And the reason why I can get it turned around is because I, I, I help them create a strategy which will box them in. Remember when you're talking about a narcissist, the most important thing to them is narcissistic supply. But when you're dealing with a narcissist and you're dealing with that narcissistic supply, remember that the supply that means the most to them is how they look. 
what people think of them. They want the rest of the world to think that they're wonderful that or that they're the victim and that you're the bad one and they want to get that preemptive strike going in there. So they put you on the defensive right away. So what you need to do is create a strategy that's going to threaten a source of supply that means more to your spouse to keep than the supply that she's getting from making you miserable. And she's getting lots and lots of supply by watching you squirm, by watching you know her be on top or, or him or whoever it is that's um, on the other side. And so that's what's really going on. And nar- the, the beautiful thing about narcissists is that they are so simple to understand. They only want one thing and that's that supply, but they go after it in many different ways, but they're actually very, very predictable. They're very predictable in how they will act in, in any kind of a discard phase, but especially when they're dealing with it, somebody in divorce or end of a business partnership or anything like that. They fight dirty. That's what they do. They don't have ethics. They, they just, it, you know, it's the equivalent of the kick in the groin, the pulling of the hair, the biting of the ear, whatever they have to do so that they can come on top. But you can develop a strategy which will allow you to uh, box them in and, and narcissists eventually do self-destruct. If you give them enough rope, they eventually get to a point where they start making mistakes, where they start coming unglued. Um, they'll, they'll act like they're moving forward and they're really good at this magical thinking and moving forward and not seeing their path of destruction behind them. But they will eventually self-destruct if you surround them and put them in a place where they have no choice but to resolve matters with you. And and that's what I teach in the Slate program. That's what I teach on these videos. That's what I teach in everything that I do because I figured it out. I figured out how to negotiate with them in a way that helps you see movement and get where you wanna go.